We think women need to talk more openly about money because money really matters. It shouldn't be embarrassing or confusing. Join the conversation. We'll be discussing a whole range of topics which will help you get comfortable with your finances. Money Matters. Brought to you by AJ Bell. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Money Matters podcast. I'm Laura Souter. And I'm Danny Hewson. And today we're talking to a woman who really does seem to have the whole world at her feet. But recently she's realised that she needs to make some big changes when it comes to her money. Even things like having a family, having a baby within the world of sport, like I said, if I have to take a year out because I want a baby and start a family, I, that's, I don't have an income for that year, I don't have any maternity pay, there's nothing there for me, so you have to think about that as well. So that was Georgia Taylor-Brown. Now, triathlon, which she competes in, is one of the few sports that's um, very equal between men and women, particularly when it comes to prize funds. And because of the insane demands that Georgia puts on her body, she knows she's only got a a finite amount of time, really, to grab those plaudits. Olympic gold medalist. Wow. I don't think that I would be able to even vaguely consider that anymore, except when it comes to biscuits. We could compete well at that, I think. Maybe that's a future podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Now, obviously, we're not all Olympians and we wish we were, but a lot of the issues that Georgia faces face a lot of women out there. So whether that's being self-employed or whether that's thinking about when you want to take a break from your career to start a family. Yes. So, you know, a lot of the issues, as you say, are, are faced by other women. Things like for Georgia is, you know, sometimes she earns an awful lot in one year and then sometimes she maybe doesn't earn quite so much and she's also got some issues that a lot of women have as well like thinking about how to make sure that she's got a cushion for when she wants to start a family maybe. And so um, we've got one of AJ Bell's experts in to help her with some of those, Lisa Webster. Um, And so she's going to talk about some of those issues about the gender investment gap um, and some of the pitfalls that you might fall into if you're self-employed like Georgia is. Because you were talking about the gender investment gap there and it still really rankles with me that women don't save as much as men. In fact, we did some research which found that women have half the levels of savings and investments on average and that is something that we're really hoping that we're going to be able to at least help flip a little bit as part of this Money Matters campaign. And Georgia was really open to joining in that conversation. And I think it's really interesting when prominent people and prominent women um, lift the lid a bit on their own personal finances and, and some of the struggles and problems they face, which we then realise are probably very similar to what we all face. I caught up with Georgia in Manchester a few weeks ago. She just got back from Malibu. Very but nice. she did have a new title and she came armed with a couple of Olympic medals. Rather heavy. Uh, everyone in the office, of course, wanted to hold them, but I got her uh, alone for a few minutes and I started by asking her about the challenges that she'd faced in the last year. Georgia Taylor Brown, most people will know you because of the Olympics. And I have to start with that because what an absolute achievement. What what was it like when you got on the podium and you got that gold medal? Um, I think if you speak to any Olympic medalist, they would obviously were so happy and proud of what we've achieved. But I think the one word to sum it up is just relief because it's such a big build up for that whole three-year period before the Games and you're so focused on getting selection first of all, staying fit enough, being as fit as possible for the Games and as fast as possible that you've ever been in your entire life and it all just builds up and you're constantly, the months leading into the Games, you're on the edge constantly because you're pushing your body so much but you don't want to tip it over and I think just to cross the finish line you're just relieved that it's it's done. The whole the nerves are gone, the pressure's off you, and you're just relieved that it's it's over, which is quite a sad way to look at it. But it's like that's just the honest truth because it is just a relief to know that, yeah, that when I crossed the finish line, I just fell to the floor and just squeezed myself into a ball and just cried because I was so happy, but I was also like. I don't know, there's so many different emotions. You're so, so happy. You're just relieved it's over. You're kind of sad that it's over because all of that's done now and it's the Olympics is done for another few years. So, 
Yeah, I'd say one word to describe it is just relief. And you're a triathlete. How did you get into that? Because it's not enough just to be good at running. You're doing three things. Yeah, so um, I was a swimmer from like the age of five. Uh, and then I never really stopped swimming because I, I enjoyed going to swimming because my friends were at swimming and I enjoyed being around them and spending time with them and that got me to the pool. Uh, and then when I was about 13, 14, I started cross country running just through school. So then mum kind of suggested, I don't, I don't know how this makes any sense, suggested that I add another sport in because I had so much time, obviously. So then she suggested, why don't we give triathlon a go? And there was a trial day coming up at British Triathlon uh, to be in sort of the talent squad. So I went along to that. I never have done a triathlon before, and everyone there had done triathlons. But I went along to that anyway, and to my surprise, I got on the squad, um, and they took a bit of a, a chance with me, to be honest. A lot of women in the past have spoken about that, the pay gap between men and women in sport. Clearly, when you were getting into this, you'd not really thought about it, but you have discovered very happily that this is one area where men and women are paid the same. Yeah, yeah, and we're, we're very lucky because most sports, that isn't the case. Um, and some sports, are the, even the events are completely different. They're on different days. Cycling, for instance, it's completely, completely separate events and separate paychecks, separate everything, sponsorships, teams, whereas triathlon, we have events on the same day. We even have a mixed event, so we race with the men. We get equal prize money. We have equal rights. Our voices are heard exactly the same. We have a committee board that has equal amount of men and women on it. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's, it's nice to, to see that and know that triathlon's mostly always been about like that for as well as long as I've been in it at least so yeah I think it's just I, I feel quite grateful that I'm in a sport where we are in that situation and I, I can't imagine what it's like for other sports where they don't have the same opportunities and they don't have the same races they can't earn, earn as much money it's, it's sad and it shouldn't be that way but things are definitely changing and things are definitely get, getting better in other sports but I think triathlon, it's, yeah, we're kind of leading the way in the equality sector. I could talk to you all day about the sport, about your Olympic journey, but this is a money podcast, yeah. so we're, we're going to talk about money as well. Um, as an athlete, you're self-employed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you don't have all that security net of a workplace pension or somebody paying you a monthly salary you've got to figure all of that out for yourself have you had a lot of help did you know what you were doing uh no not at all so i uh at the age of 16 i got onto uk sport lottery funding uh so i got onto the performance squad of british triathlon when you when you hit certain criteria so then I had to get a medal at European Juniors and a medal at World Juniors. So it's not easy. Um, it's doable, but it's not easy. But once you do that, you then you can get onto funding. Uh, so you go in at the lowest level and you get paid a certain wage every month. Um, but that changes every single year. So you might have a good year or you might have a year where you're injured and you'll get kicked off funding. So it's not, yeah, it, it constantly, it can constantly change and uh, you can have that funding taken away from you. So it's nice to know that you've got that and it, it helps able, like you can pay the bills, you can, you're able to go to races because of it. Um, but then, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to keep and, and to stay there because you just don't know what's going to happen in sport. Anything can happen at any time. Um, so yeah, at 16, I got onto that and then, um, and then from there, you sort of start to get into, as you get older, you get into races where you can earn more prize money. But then once I had a really good year in 2018, I earned a lot of money and I just didn't know what to do with it. I was quite stressed about it, actually, because I just, I, was, I panicked. I was like, oh God, now I have to start paying tax on this money and I have to do that all myself. I have to figure out how I'm going to pay this. And there was no advice there for me at the time. And it is, it's quite daunting. Had you ever had any education at school? Anyone ever spoken to you about paying taxes or pensions or interest rates or buying a house? No, not at all. No, it's something that I don't know. I guess 
as a kid, you're always like, I can't wait to get my own house. Well, me anyway, I was like, can't wait to get my own house and it'll be so cool and it'll all be so easy and I'm going to be an adult. And then you get to adult life and you realise that things cost a lot of money and it takes a lot of money. And then when you have that money, it doesn't make things any easier. It doesn't make buying a house any easier. It just makes it more stressful because you've got to think about all the other little things and where that money's going. And, and for you buying a house as well, because you're not doing a nine to five job. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine just getting a mortgage is, is jumping through lots of hoops. Yeah, getting a mortgage is hard work and I didn't think it was going to happen. I thought I would have to, I thought have, my dad might have to buy a house for me and it would be his house, which is a shame, but I thought that's how it might have had to, how it had to go for me to be able to get a house. Because um, it is difficult because you can't rely on an athlete's income because it's different every year. Like I said, we could get injured and you get no income one year. So I also have to think about that now as well. If I have a good year, I can't just go and spend all that money. I have to think about, well, next year I might not have a good year, so I need money for that year. Um, but yeah, buying a house was, it was quite, it was stressful to start thinking about the process, but then when I found a good mortgage advisor, it was all quite straightforward actually, and he made that really easy for me, and just as easy as possible. I had to provide a lot of evidence, obviously, but uh, that was all made quite easy. But it was very scary and daunting at the start. What I like is the fact that you've travelled all around the world, you've competed Tokyo Olympics, you've just come back from Malibu, but for you, the only place that you want to live is Yorkshire, where your home is. Yeah, definitely, yeah. And I think it's also, well, like buying the house, it's my house, and I'm so proud of what I've been able to achieve in my career. And then from that, I've been able to buy this lovely little house in Yorkshire and I've got a piece of Yorkshire and it's yeah it's just I just love it there so much and I'm just happy there and so settled there and it's home so I just I love going back there every day and I get excited to go home. Now some people will have seen you your last win and looked at the prize money and thought oh she's doing all right but you have no idea how long you're going to be able to compete for. So are you now starting to think about what happens in 10 years time? What am I going to do? How am I going to support myself? And the dreaded P word, particularly when you're only in your twenties, pension. Yeah, yeah. And even things like having a family, having a baby in the world of sport, like I said, if I have to take a year out because I want a baby and start a family, I, that's, I don't have an income for that year. I don't have any maternity pay. There's nothing there for me. So you have to think about that as well. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's great that you earn all this money and it's amazing at the time. You don't, you don't really think about it at the time and then you, you kind of see it come into your account. And then it looks lovely, but you panic because you think, well, what am I going to do with that money? Whereas it's just, it's literally just sat there and it's costing me to have that money just sat there. I'm getting nothing from it. And I don't know anything about money. I don't, I'm, I'm just here to do sport. That's all I'm here to do. And the money's great, but I, yeah, it's kind of stressful and we get no, we get no education on that. And I think it, that, yeah, it's, it's, it's scary when you, when you come to think of it. You see, you've just said two words which shouldn't go hand in hand with money, stressful and scary. Yeah. Money is supposed to be that safety net. It's supposed to buy you the nice things in life and, and, and give you a good life. Mm -hmm. And yet it, it seems because there aren't enough conversations about money that it's kind of taboo almost. Yeah. And like you said earlier, for me, it's thinking about that money is it is lovely but I have to think of that as my pension so it, it's there but I can't spend it um, so I have to think okay I'm maybe going to be in triathlon for until I'm 34 I might have two more Olympics in me but then at 34 I, my, my body's probably going to give in it'll get injured constantly I won't be able to do this anymore so what now like people's careers are only just taking off at 34 and my career's just coming to an end so then I have to think well, I'm going to have to enter the real world and get a normal job. And that's, that's scary. I don't want to have to think about that right now because I'm just so grateful and happy in what I'm doing. Um, but, yeah, it's, it is something that I, I constantly do worry about. And, I, like, with the, the money that I'm in, it's great. And I shouldn't have to worry about money. Uh, and I should be able to go on a training camp if I want to or 
be able to get a room decorated in the house because I've I've worked hard for that money. But then I, I constantly think, well, no, I can't really afford it because in eight years' time or whatever, I'm, I'm not going to be doing this and I'm going to need money to, to pay for things. So I, I constantly yeah, worry about what if something happens? What if I can't do triathlon next year? I need money to, to get me by until I can get a job. So lots of young girls look up to you and I know one of the nicest things for you was uh, an email you got after the Olympics because you had an awful time when you hoping for gold and then you get a puncture and you've got to battle that and deal with the mental anxiety of I've probably lost this that's it and you kept going and you got silver and then you got a lovely email from a young girl. Yeah, I got an email from, uh, I think she was uh, just a five-year-old little girl and uh, was learning to ride a bike. And her dad sent an email um, with some pictures just to say, you really you really helped my daughter get on a bike and, and ride it. She was really struggling at the start. She couldn't get a hang of it. And she watched you race triathlon and she said, well, Georgia managed to get through that puncture and she got back on a bike. So I'm going to carry on and I'm going to do this. And just for a little girl to have that determination, just from watching me do one race, that's the most incredible feeling I've ever had, to be honest. And when I get emails like that and messages on Twitter and things, it's just, I don't, it just makes me so happy and that's all I ever want to do. And I, like, I know how proud that'll make my parents of who I've become and, and what I've managed to achieve and who I've managed to inspire. And that's all I really want to do. I just want to inspire little girls to take up sport or, or little boys to take up sport and just pursue a dream and just have a dream and just really focus on it because I from the age of 10 I kind of I wrote a powerpoint presentation and on there I said I wanted to go to the Olympics and maybe win a medal one day and now I've achieved my 10 year old dream and not many people can say that so it's quite it's quite a special feeling and also a surreal feeling like if I could talk to my 10 year old self now I would I guess before the games I would be like why did you set me such a big dream why couldn't you just be happy with a normal life why did you have to go for an Olympic medal and then now I can say to my 10 year old self like we did it as a team and we got through all those rough periods and got a medal and achieved that childhood dream. Now it's no Olympic medal but by talking about money like this hopefully you'll inspire little girls little boys to not only strive to achieve, to maybe get a gold medal, but also to think that little bit earlier about money and about whole life wealth. Yeah, definitely. And I think, yeah, I think you just need to, you just need to have that education when you went from, from a young age um, and then know what you want in life as well. And I think for me as well, it's about proving myself right. You have all these ambitions and these dreams from from being a kid and you want to be able to achieve them because you've set them and some way like you know that you can achieve it it's going to be hard uh, but you can achieve it but yeah I think there's just the education uh, needs to be there and people just need to I don't know believe in a little bit of a, bit, a little bit of magic as well <laughs> that was lovely oh, what a lovely place to end it oh, thank you thank very you. much thank you <laughs> so that was the Pretty impressive, Georgia Taylor Brown. I'm a bit jealous that you got to do that interview, to be honest. <laughs> she was absolutely lovely. And what I really liked is the fact that she wants to inspire people, not just when it comes to young kids interested in sport, but she also wants to inspire people when it comes to money. That's why she was so keen to get involved in this campaign. She told a really lovely story, actually, about when she was uh, in the Olympics and she suffered from that puncture and it all looked to be going terribly. And she'd got this lovely email from a young girl who said, I watched you and because you got back on your bike and kept going, I have got back on my bike and I've learned to ride my bike. And that is the sort of inspiration that sporting stars like Georgia can really give to people. And she's hoping that she might be able just to, you know, get a few people that are listening to this podcast, maybe to start thinking about their own finances, to start talking about money, because she said it's really important. And it was only by talking to some of her fellow athletes that she realized that she needed to start thinking about her 
own future and make her money work for her. And that shows how important it is for people to have these conversations with friends and colleagues about money. Um, And there are particular things that self-employed people need to think about. Their finances differ slightly. Um, They don't have the safety net of an employer and they have to deal with a lot of things by themselves, for example, pensions. Um, So I've been getting some tips from one of our AJ Bell colleagues. So self-employed people obviously don't have the backstop of an employer to set up a lot of things for them. So I'm thinking a pension or to pay their national insurance or sort out some of their tax issues. Um, So they very much kind of have to deal with a lot of this on their own. So we want to talk a bit about some of those problems they might face and and how they could overcome them, particularly because more women than men generally are self-employed. So let's start with the pension. That's the biggie. Why should self-employed people worry about getting a pension? Because obviously, any time they're focusing on things like this, they're taking away from their business and, and doing what they love and, and what's making their money. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it, it's really important if, uh, you know, if if one day they want to stop working. Um, a lot of the time, uh, you know, with self-employed people, that you know they are the business. Uh, I mean, in some circumstances, they may have a business they can sell and they can use some money from that. But that's not always the case. If, you know, if they themselves are the business, when they want to wind down and retire, they need to have something to live on. Um, and, you know, I mean, the first point is really sort of rounding national insurance contributions. Um, there are self-employed national insurance contributions that you pay, which will uh, help you with your entitlement to state pension. Um, and if you're not earning enough, then you might want to consider voluntary um, contributions just to top up to make sure you do get the benefit of the state pension. Uh, but you know, even if you do do all of that, I mean, for most people, the state pension isn't going to afford them a lifestyle that they want to uh, retire on. You know, it's only going to cover your your, ba- your basics at best. Um, so you know, it is important to save. You know, to make provision. Um, for retirement and you know there are incentives to do this so I mean the the obvious one is tax relief so if you're self-employed you can put in up to 100% of your earnings up to £40,000 a year into a pension and you'll get tax relief on that so you know if you put £80 in the government will top that up with £20 and make it up to £100 uh, in the pension scheme if you are a higher rate taxpayer you'll also get extra tax relief for the higher rate or even additional rate relief if you're earning that much uh, by your self-assessment. So when you do your self-assessment at the end of the year, which self-employed people are going to be doing, um, it means their tax bill at the end of the year will be less. So, you know, there's incentives there to save and it's all tax free once it's within that um, tax wrapper um, as well. So, you know, it it is important that you do that. and I think one of the key things really for self-employed people is, is about flexibility because obviously the, the, the earnings, generally speaking, are going to be more unreliable than somebody who's employed. So it's going to fluctuate a lot more. Um, but, you know, you can pay in more in years that you do well and you have more income and then maybe, you know, a little bit less at, uh, at other times. And so, obviously, when you're employed, you have the perk that your company sets up that pension and all you have to do is decide what percentage you're going to contribute and they take care of most of the rest of it for you. Um, So, for a self-employed person, a little bit more tricky, how do they actually go about setting up a, a pension? Where do you even start with that? Yeah, it is more difficult. You do have to do it, obviously, off your own back, set up a personal pension. Um, there's three main types. We've got stakeholder pensions, you've got personal pensions, and then you've got SIPs, self-invested personal pensions. Um, I mean, a good starting point for a lot of information is probably the Money Helper website, moneyhelper.org.uk. That's a government-backed free guidance service. So there's loads of information on there about the different types of pensions. Um, but basically, you know, a stakeholder pension, there are limits on terms of how much they can charge for that. There's cost caps on it, so it's going to be a low cost pension. Um, there's also the minimum contributions that you pay in, the amount of money you have to pay in each month will be quite low on those. But it's probably going to be a bit more limited in terms of investment choices, kind of like the basic option, if you like. Um, you've then got personal pensions, uh, mainly from the insurance companies, uh, which might give you a little bit more um, flexibility in terms of investment choice and how you pay in. Um, but it'll still be, it can be a more limited fund range than the self-invested personal pension, which is like the one that can do all sorts, you know, a much wider investment choice, uh, generally more flexible. Um, 
they can be for more, you know, if you want to do more complicated things that you can't do in a personal pension, but there are some very low cost options on there as well. So it really depends what you want to do, how confident you are choosing your own investments uh, and things like that, really. And so do you have any kind of top tips for self-employed people that are setting up their own pension? So we kind of now understand why they need to and how they might go about understanding it. Um, What are the kind of top tips to help them? Well, first thing is uh, cost is going to be really important uh, because obviously if you're paying high cost, that can really eat away at your savings and make a big difference. So it's important to shop around. Um, And yes, you could get something that is all fancy, does all these lots of flexible things, but if you're not going to use it, are you paying for it? Um, You know, think about what, how are you going to use it? Um, make sure obviously that your provider is regulated by the FCA, Financial Conduct Authority, um, or the pension regulator. They may regulate some of the stakeholder pensions. Um, and yeah, shopping around really is the main thing. You can get um, sort of illustrations from the providers, which will give you an idea if you pay it this much each year, you know, how much you're likely to get out of it and compare the costs and charges on it. And so I guess probably the other big area for women who are self-employed is, is maybe thinking about starting a family and, and how that fits in with being self-employed. So they won't have the benefit of having maternity pay paid for by an employer. Um, so how, what kind of things should they be thinking about if they think that's on the horizon? Yeah, so you don't get maternity pay, but you might qualify for maternity allowance instead if you're self-employed. Um, it does depend a bit on your, again, your national insurance record. So if you've been paying class two national insurance contributions, which if you're self-employed and you have earnings of more than about six and a half thousand pounds a year, you will be paying those. You will have to pay those. If you're in a bit less, um, then you can pay those voluntarily to top it up. Um, but if if you've paid those for it's roughly about every six, you know six months in the like year and a bit before your due date, then you'll qualify for maternity allowance, uh, and that will be at either ninety percent of your average weekly earnings up to a maximum. It's just over one hundred and fifty pounds a week. It changes each year, but this year it's about one hundred and fifty pounds a week, uh, and you can get that for up to nine months. Um, there is a a much smaller amount if you don't have the full. Uh, national insurance record so there is something there Um, and again it's just really the importance of having that national insurance record I think because you know it does qualify you for a lot of other benefits as well um, if you're self-employed. One other thing to know which I actually have only just found out about recently myself is that um, if you have a partner who's self-employed there's no male equivalent of paternity allowance so you get paternity pay from your employer uh, for, for a few weeks and there's obviously things you can do to split maternity leave um, between male and female partners um, but there's nothing if you're self-employed so if your um, partner is is self-employed that obviously you need to factor that into the equation you're thinking about it as well because they won't be entitled um, to any benefits in the same way that you, you do get a maternity allowance. Oh that is interesting I didn't know that either. Mm -hmm. Um, And so then I guess the other things are just kind of planning ahead, right? So thinking about how how much work you might be able to do or might be able to carry on without you and and planning ahead financially for however long you want to take off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just sort of, I suppose because you have more variance in earnings, it's sort of having that sort of cash buffer as well, isn't it? And, 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 you know, being prepared. So... Um, Obviously, pensions we've talked about and pensions are really great for saving for later on in life, you know, when when you're not working anymore. Um, Obviously, tax incentives to do that, but also, you know, saving for, you know, periods if you're not, you know, you're not working at the moment or you're not earning as much, you you know, things are fluctuating, having uh, having a a base savings um, of cash savings and investments. And obviously, you could consider things like, obviously, ISAs. Um, because there's still um, a good method for saving into you still have the tax advantages you don't pay any tax within those tax wrappers but if you needed to access them you know you can do so um, and the other one for the uh, for the under 40s uh, people would be a lifetime ISA you can start up until the day before your 40th birthday a lifetime ISA which you can use to get on the property ladder if you're a first time buyer you can use it towards that um, and you can also use it once you to access the money once you're over the age of 60. And actually, if you're a basic rate taxpayer, the sort of tax position on that, because the way the government pay you a bonus on the money going in, it's almost as good as a pension 
uh, it's a bit different if you pay more tax than the, than the uh, for, for the retirement benefits than the uh, pension looks like a better option. But if you're if you're basically a taxpayer, then the lifetime ISA is also a good one to consider. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. It was really helpful. Thank you. Well, hopefully that maybe has sparked something within you all. Maybe it's got you chatting at home. If you do want to join in our conversation and we'd love to hear from you, do get in touch if you've got any comments or questions or or maybe there's a subject that you want us to tackle. Yeah, and make sure that you subscribe and review. It means that more people will see the podcast um, and also means that you won't miss an episode. Before you go, please remember this podcast is for educational purposes and the views expressed don't necessarily reflect those of AJ Bell. The podcast isn't telling you whether certain investments are suitable or not. And don't forget that the value of investments can change and you can lose money as well as make it. It's also important to remember that tax rules apply and that the way an investment performed in the past may not be the same as how it behaves in the future. If you want help, go see a qualified financial advisor.